Welcome to the NFL Fantasy Football Show, presented by DraftKings. Here's your host, Marcus Grant. What is up? Welcome to another edition of the NFL Fantasy Football Show, presented by DraftKings. It's me, your man, MG Marcus Grant, still masking and socially distancing when and where appropriate. We've got a big Friday show for you. Some interesting headlines from some things going on around the National Football League. We'll recap the Thursday night football game as well. Michael F. Florio will join us as he always does, and we will talk some of your daily fantasy best value picks for those of you of the daily persuasion who plan to play some fantasy football this weekend. So we got that and plenty more coming up for you this day. And before we do all of that, as we always do, we'll talk to our faithful producer, senior Edward L. Murphy Esquire. And Murph, I know you are, are something of a, a foodie. I know you like to try different restaurants. I saw news, some sad news this morning that I guess uh, the Jerry's Famous Deli in Studio City that's been there for 40 plus years is uh, shutting down. I don't know if you ever had a chance to to eat at any of the Jerry's or the one at Studio City specifically. No, I uh, I haven't. I um, yeah, you are correct. Um, I I do enjoy food here. I'm I have like I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate that my um, my girlfriend works for Spectrum and has like a food segment. So like last night she went to a, a Polish place, Solidarity, uh, over in the West Side, I think, in Santa Monica, and just brings back like trays of Polish food. It's like I'm trying to be somewhat healthy during quarantine, <laughs> and it just gets thrown out the window when I'm just getting all this food thrown to me. But but yeah, I have not tried that place yet. I live close to uh, Canner's Deli, which is like one of my favorites in Los Angeles. I mean, there's just so many uh, good spots to eat here. Um, I don't feel like at a loss leaving New York coming here because there's so many great places. But but yeah, I mean, I, I am I'm always open to trying to try new stuff. You know, Cantor's is, is one of my favorite places in L.A. too. And I love the fact that uh, I think in the final season of Mad Men, Don Draper goes mm-hmm. to L.A. and they, he has like a lunch or dinner meeting at Cantor's. And I love the fact that Cantor's still looks the same now as it probably did in like the mid to late yeah. 60s. So I don't think they had to dress the place up at all for him to be there. Canners is awesome. And a lot of places in LA have this as well with the history of like, oh, which uh, famous celebrity from years past sat there or, or did whatever there. But like Canners, besides the comedy store, all the all the old comics used to come there at like, you know, one, two o'clock in the morning and hang out there. And like Guns N' Roses would play the kids room like 3 a.m. Like there's so many cool things that happen there. Like you have to read into all these restaurants around Los Angeles because you never know like what the, the history is. It's, it's pretty cool. Right, my, my one last quick canner story is that when I was, I think I just graduated from college and uh, they were having their 75th anniversary. So they rolled their prices once a week uh, for specific sandwiches back to their opening day uh, price. So like for once wow. we, we stood in line for, we stood in line for like three hours just to get a 25 cent pastrami sandwich. Worth it. Oh, <laughs> oh man. The pastrami Reuben, it's all I get. You don't, all you need, I could live on that pastrami Reuben there every day for the rest of my life. I wouldn't be healthy, but I would enjoy myself. <laughs> That's all right. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, so that was our food talk here on the Fantasy Football Show. Uh, we'll bring in another New Yorker, the only, the one and only Michael F. Florio, who uh, I don't know if you have sampled any of the delis around uh, Los Angeles and, and how they compare maybe to some of the New York delis that you may be familiar with. Yeah, I definitely have. Um, like I've been to Candor's. They they hold up to like uh, I'm forgetting the name of the famous pastrami deli in New York right now, but uh, it compares. My fiance is a huge foodie and has really turned me into one in recent years. As, as Callie is trying to, she hears food, she's trying to get it. Um, <laughs> so if I, I've tried a lot of the famous LA places, but if if you or Eddie or anyone has any recommendations, you could always shoot it my way. I will, absolutely will. And is it was it Carnegie or Stage Door? I know those are two of the bigger one, two of the more famous ones. Carnegie. Right. That was Carnegie. the one I was thinking of. There you go. All right. Uh, all right. So we got plenty to talk about in this one. Let's start, though, with the Thursday night football game. The Falcons uh, get by and hold off the Panthers by a score of 25 to 17. So Atlanta uh, putting together a couple of wins right now. The Panthers right now in free fall with three straight losses. The top scorers, Curtis Samuel, ended up having a big day with a couple of touchdowns in that one. Julio Jones, seven catches for a buck 37. And then Matt Ryan, just under 18 points, 281 passing yards and interception, but also 27 rushing yards and a touchdown. The one thing, though, that was a little bit surprising, Todd Gurley came out, played in the first quarter uh, of the ball game. Then we didn't see him for a good long while until the second half. We saw a lot of Brian Hill. We saw some Kadri Allison. Anything about what we saw in in terms of his usage, Gurley's usage last night, that concerns you? Oh, yeah. I was at at halftime. He had played less than 50% of the snaps. And I I tweeted, Marcus, I saw 
uh, uh, like I saw you tweeting and a lot of people were like where is Todd Gurley right now and then they kept showing him on the sidelines like stretching and he was on the bike at one point I saw him like kicking his legs out trying to stay loose and and like Joe Buck and the announcers were like where is Todd Gurley like everyone was kind of wondering so yeah I was definitely worried he salvaged his day with a touchdown but Going up against the Panthers, like, I had him ranked as a top 10 running back. I expected a lot more last night. I think he disappointed. I don't know if it was his knee was bothering him or what it was, but the usage is definitely a concern. I know a lot of people were making the joke that, you know, this is this was punishment for him inadvertently scoring that <laughs> touchdown the week before. And yeah, I mean, like, I, I get the joke, absolutely. But it is just weird that he would come out, start the game, and then just vanish for a long stretch, come back in the second half. And, and as you mentioned, what was a really great matchup. So that was a head scratcher. Maybe we'll get some more clarification on it in the, the days to come. But uh, that was one that I think kind of caught everybody by surprise. Uh, and and really sort of uh, you know, has people asking questions. Uh, the other thing, and you know, there's no real question here, but other than that, that Calvin Ridley left the game with what looks like a foot injury. I know the initial uh, x-rays were negative. I think we're sort of waiting further tests on that, but that's going to be a thing to definitely keep an eye on uh, going forward if Calvin Ridley can't get on the field for the Falcons. On the other side, Curtis Samuel ended up having two touchdowns, had a huge first half. I think he only had one or two touches completely in the second half. Didn't do much. But what do we make of how the Panthers worked him into the game yesterday? I think it's it's definitely interesting, but I, I'm not ready to fully invest in him in fantasy because so much of what he did, you know, the, the goal line touchdown, the second one in a, in a two-week span that, that he'd received, not Mike Davis, but... When Christian McCaffrey comes back, I mean, those goal line touches are going his way, at least in my opinion. Like, I'd be surprised if we see Curtis Samuel getting those. And then four catches, 31 yards, and a TD. Like, that that was – and the long catch was great to see. It was impressive if you started him in fantasy. But with Robbie Anderson and DJ Moore still being there and still going to get their fair share of targets each week, I think Curtis Samuel is nothing more than, like, a boomer bust wide receiver. Later, deeper wide receiver option. He's one of those guys that, again, there's a whole list of guys out there that are, I think, good and useful for real football, but not so much for fantasy. And I think Curtis Samuel sort of slots into that because we saw that they used him in so many different ways. And I know that was actually the scouting report on him coming out of college, that he could be a bit of a Swiss Army knife. You could use him as a runner. You could use him as a receiver. And that's what they've been doing the last couple of weeks. But that kind of usage is going to be by its very nature, sort of inconsistent, especially when, as you mentioned, they still have Robbie Anderson, DJ Moore as their primary receivers. Christian McCaffrey is very likely going to be back next week. So that means the Mike Davis run is officially over. So uh, I, I I felt like Curtis Samuel this year was going to be the odd man out. It's been nice to see him produce the last couple of weeks, but I, I'm with you, Florio. I don't know that it's going to be consistent enough for anybody to really count on him outside of like really, really deep leagues or you know if you've got injuries or buys or that sort of thing that, that have you shorthanded. It's, it's just going to be hard to, to count on him. So the last thing about this thing is the la pretty much all year long, we have decided we can pick on the Falcons defense, that they are kind of a soft target. But last week, you know, Matthew Stafford didn't have a huge day. I mean, Kenny Galladay had over 100 yards, but it was just an okay day when it was all said and done. This past week, you know, Teddy Bridgewater was not great. Uh, Mike Davis was sort of underwhelming. Neither of the, the primary receivers for the Panthers did much to, to write home about. So is it time to start to stop picking on the Falcons defense, or is this just kind of a, a two-week good run for them? I I'm not fully ready yet to say like this is a defense that we can no longer pick on but I don't think it is you know the no-brainer you start everyone against this team I will say last night was pretty bad weather it looked like heavy rain and they were saying the wind was was blowing so I think that that obviously played it helped the Falcons it was harder to pass when when the weather was poor and and last week the Lions I was high on Matt Stafford in that passing game. They disappointed. I think that might say more about the Lions right now and the state of their offense than it does the Falcons. But they are not the slam dunk, but I'm not saying like, oh, you can't stream against them yet. I think we need to see at least one more week of them playing like much better defense before I'm I'm fully out on the on streaming against the Falcons defense. And the other part of this, I will say that the the opposing scores haven't necessarily been awful. I mean, Matt Stafford was okay. 
Uh, like I said, Kenny Galladay was okay. It just They just weren't the huge blow-up games that I think we were sort of hoping for there. So uh, I'm with you. I'm, I'm not really ready to just be all out on the Falcons. Now, next week, the Broncos are their opponents. So maybe we still take a chance on guys like Noah Fant on, on uh, the running backs, whether it's Melvin Gordon or Phillip Lindsay. I think we can still sort of be in on those guys. But uh, look, Raheem Morris uh, maybe is turning some things around. So they're not quite the easy target uh, that they were earlier in the season. All right, let's transition to some fantasy headlines, a couple of big stories that will have some fantasy impact uh, this week and going forward. The first one, Julian Edelman uh, is going to have knee surgeries. This knee has apparently been bothering him all season long, so he is going to for sure miss this week's game against the Buffalo Bills. Beyond that, we're not totally sure what the prognosis is, how long he's going to be out. So... This is a Patriots offense that has been struggling for the last couple of weeks. With no Julian Edelman, are there any Patriots that you'd consider starting against Buffalo? I don't really think so. I think if maybe if, you know, the state of running back and, and all the, the RBs on buys and then the injuries that are piling up there, like in a deeper league or if you're just kind of desperate at running back like I am in some leagues, and I'm someone who was prioritizing the position in drafts and I'm still diving deep on the waiver wires, I think there – James White or Damian Harris can come into play. But outside of that, that's really it. Like Cam Newton hasn't looked the same since he's returned. And it's just dragging down that passing game. I actually had Julian Edelman as a player that I thought was droppable before we learned about his knee injury this week. So I think now having to wait maybe a couple weeks to get him back, I do think you can drop him. Nikhil Harry, like I think he has upside. But right now I would not want to trust him in my starting lineup, especially if he's getting a lot of Trey White. So right now, I just think this offense is one to completely avoid. To be honest, the Patriots receiver who might quietly be having the best season might be Demir Bird. Uh, I mean, he's, he's getting a lot. And, but that's not saying much, right? Because nobody is talking about him. Nobody is considering starting him. So I think that speaks a lot to where the Patriots offense is right now. And for those of us who were excited about Cam Newton, who liked what we saw from him the first couple of weeks, uh, this is another big blow to, to any of his production on, on top of the fact that he just flat out is not playing well right now. But now you're also taking away uh, one of the most consistent weapons in that offense. So it is really hard to to start any Patriots. Again, I, I think I, people have asked me about Damian Harris and depending on who your other options are, I, I might say yes on that. But uh, things are not good right now for New England. And uh, it is it is not going to be a fun time to start any Patriots anywhere in your fantasy roster. Speaking of starting, it looks like rookie Ben DiNucci could be making his first start this week for the Dallas Cowboys. Andy Dalton had a concussion that he suffered after a nasty hit last week against Washington, and all signs point to him not being able to get on the field this week against Philadelphia. So we have seen that the Dallas pass catchers have sort of struggled the last couple of weeks with Dalton there. Now they've got a completely new quarterback would you start any of these Dallas pass catchers against the Eagles? I think the only one that you could start is Amari Cooper. And even that, he's a lot lower for me than obviously than with Dak and even then with Andy Dalton. Like, we don't really have any idea of of Ben DiNucci's pass tendencies, of, of who he of which of these pass catchers he is going to rely on the most. For what it's worth, he threw three passes last week. Two of them did go to Amari Cooper. I don't think that's really worth a whole lot. But Cooper has been the most consistent and, and volume-wise and fantasy production-wise this year. So I do think that if you're going to start any of them, he is the guy. I, I'm someone who is very high on CD Lamb coming into this year and early on that looked great. But I am I'm benching him everywhere I have him. I'm dropping Michael Gallup right now. And it's just, it's a pretty ugly situation right now in Dallas. It went from us feeling like Dallas had just a, a fountain of fantasy talent to now it, I think everybody's looking around and saying, what do we do with our Cowboys at this point? And uh, last week, CD Lamb scored 0.1 fantasy points, which <laughs> in a PPR world is really hard to do. I mean, right? Like just the fact that you get one full point for catching the football uh, the fact that you would score 0.1 fantasy points total uh, really speaks to where this offense is right now. And, and, and he still match. outscored Michael Gallup. And he still outscored Michael Gallup. I mean, so at this <laughs> point, Gallup, he's droppable, right? I mean, we, we can we can move on from Michael Gallup at this point, can't we? 
I think so. He's had one top thirty-five wide receiver game all year. Like he, he had, he had that you know one or two games uh, where we thought maybe he was going to salvage something, but I think that that might do it with no Dak and certainly you know, and this week possibly with no Andy Dalton. Um, I think it, it might be over for him. On the other side, though, between Danucci starting, between the offensive line being beat up, are the Eagles? Uh, is their defense a must start this week? Yeah, I think so, and I'm pretty happy because I picked up the Eagles defense a lot of leagues last week because they played the Giants, and I didn't have to spend you know any fab or any waiver wire claims to try to pick up a new streaming defense this week because they're going up against Ben DiNucci, and again, he is just a complete unknown. This passing game has looked really bad. The, the O-line is in complete shambles right now, and the one positive in this offense you would think is Ezekiel Elliott. Well, he's having trouble holding on to the ball. He, uh, four fumbles this year leads all running backs and the Eagles strength on defense is up front against the run so I do think they are a must start defense this week. I, I feel like I think earlier in the week when I looked they were rostered in I think about 50 percent of NFL.com leagues I haven't looked since you know since Tuesday I think but I would suspect that number has gone up because I think people are going to look at this this Cowboy offense and say, you know, this this is a chance to really do something uh, you know, with a fantasy defense. And suddenly the Cowboys, we, we talk about the Falcons being a soft target. The Cowboys have become that soft target both defensively and offensively now, which is not a thing that I expected we'd say uh, with the way the season began, with just the amount of talent they seem to have on this roster. But uh, file under, life comes at you fast. Uh, all right. Today's show is sponsored by DraftKings, the leader in one-day fantasy sports. DraftKings has millions of dollars in total prizes up for grabs this week, so download the DraftKings app now. Use code TEAM during sign-up and start feeling the sweat like never before. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. Come back, we have our big questions of the week, including what do we expect from the newest rookie quarterback, not in Dallas, that is going to start a game this week. Stay tuned for more of the NFL Fantasy Football Show. So the bulk of week eight is coming at us on Sunday. And as always, we've got some big questions we want to answer that will hopefully help your fantasy squads heading in to that full Sunday of action. So let's start in Baltimore. The running back situation has been a mess pretty much all year long, but signs point to Mark Ingram not being available this week for their big matchup against the Pittsburgh Steelers. So that takes what had been a three-headed running back attack, not counting Lamar Jackson, and makes it a two-headed running back attack not counting Lamar Jackson. Uh, so choose your fighter then. Is it Gus Edwards or is it J.K. Dobbins? I think you hit the nail on the head with how just of a mess this backfield has been. I think with Mark Ingram out, it makes it a little bit better, but it comes at the worst possible time, right, against the Steelers team who have allowed the least fantasy points to running backs this year. But I'm going with J.K. Dobbins of these two guys because, one, he's – their pass catching back already like he's not seeing huge targets each week but he has 14 targets I believe it is on the year right now and the other two combined have just eight so he is that role and then he's also again it's very small numbers but he has two goal line carries this year while Gus Edwards and Mark Ingram have one apiece so he's a I mean he's a huge man I'm hoping that if they get near the goal line it is him and not Edwards they're using because hopefully he can catch a couple passes Again, though, I don't really feel great about either one of these two coming in against this tough matchup, but it is improved with no Mark Ingram there. So everything you just said about, you know, J.K. Dobbins versus Gus Edwards, I completely agree with. But for some reason, I just have a feeling this is going to be a Gus Edwards game. I don't I don't have anything other than you know, so what, inside, you know, a little little behind the curtain here before the show started, we were talking about, you know, the World Series and analytics and, and, and you know, gut feelings versus sort of playing the numbers and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the numbers and I'm seeing them and I'm understanding them, but my gut just says that somehow Gus Edwards is going to be the guy this week, uh, that he's going to rip off maybe a long run or what have you. And I don't, I don't expect either one of these guys, Dobbins or Edwards, to have a huge game because that Steelers defense, I think, is going to clamp down. If, if the Ravens are successful and if they win this game, I think they do it through the air uh, by taking some shots down the field. So I, I wouldn't love starting either of these guys. I get it if you have to. Um, I'm just saying my, my gut has this feeling that somehow Gus Edwards is going to be the guy, despite 
everything you just laid out, which is 100% accurate and makes complete and absolute sense. Uh, so there, 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 there we go. There, <laughs> that's it. Um, so now we talked about Ben DiNucci possibly making his first start for the Dallas Cowboys, but another more heralded rookie is going to make his NFL debut coming up this week. That's Tua Tagovailoa for the Miami Dolphins. And look, we have sort of been interested to see him on the field. That The matchup is not necessarily a great one this week for him uh, against a good Rams defense. But what do you expect to see from Tua this week? I'm not expecting a whole lot out of Tua this week. He is someone that I'm super excited to watch. I'm excited for his long-term fantasy outlook. But if I picked him up, I'm keeping him on the bench this week. He has a very tough matchup against the Rams defense that have allowed the seventh fewest fantasy points to quarterbacks. But even so, he's a rookie making his first start and he's asked to go against Aaron Donald and Jalen Ramsey and, and that bunch. Like to me, I think there's a lot that could go wrong here, and the upside is not particularly worth starting him, in my opinion. I think it could also be a game where they try to rely on the run a lot and and use Miles Gaskins a lot more than they did with Fitzpatrick. I'm with you. I, I want to watch it just one from a, a standpoint of being a football fan and just seeing the guy out there and seeing what he can do. But I also just kind of want to observe and, and see exactly where he's going with the football, how quickly he's getting it out, when he runs, how much he runs. I, I want to get a feel for what Tua Tagovailoa can be in the NFL. Now, in in some respects, it's good to see it against such a quality defense because that way I think we'll get a better gauge maybe of of who he's going to be. I think it would be one thing if he were starting against, say, the Cowboys defense uh, and we're just kind of running through them up and down the field that maybe we get a false sense of security. So I think this gives us a good barometer of of who he's going to be potentially. And the, the ceiling is, I think, going to be very high. So like whatever we see is not the final verdict on him. Uh, but I'm with you. I don't know that I would start him this week. I also would kind of stay away from any of the other Dolphins pass catchers. So Devontae Parker, uh, Preston Williams. Uh, maybe I'd start Mike Gesicki just because the Rams have kind of struggled against the tight end position. But I think beyond that, it's it's kind of a wait and see attitude for me uh, with any of the Dolphins players. Uh, Jonathan Taylor has not yet had the big breakout game that I think a lot of us would have wanted They've got the Lions this week, who have certainly had their defensive struggles. What sort of usage and production are you expecting from JT? I know, uh, you know, the, the pup wants to get in and answer it too, but uh, I'll ask you first. What, what do you expect from JT this week? <laughs> she has Jonathan Taylor. She listened to me and drafted Jonathan Taylor, so now <laughs> she's like, where's all my fantasy points that you promised, Ben? I think they're coming, though. I think that – um this, I think he has the potential to be this year's Miles Sanders, right? A rookie running back that just in the second half of the season catches fire. And I think it could start this week against the Lions defense that has allowed a ton of fantasy points to running backs all year long. They're in the top five in yards and points allowed to the position. Plus, Jonathan Taylor's work is pretty safe, right? Like his snaps have gone up each week since week three. Um, he's seen over, uh, he's seen 35% of the Colts touches already this year. So now that the opportunity has been there and the schedule is about to get favorable, I'm feeling very optimistic about Jonathan Taylor right now. You talk about the Lions defense giving up a lot of points to running backs, and especially over the last month, they've given up the third most points per game to, to fantasy running backs. So that's a plus in, in their favor. On, on the flip side, that. Not that their past defense has been lights out, but it has certainly been better. And you you factor that in with Phillip Rivers, who has been struggling, especially over the last few weeks. This does feel like the sort of game where the Colts sort of lean on their runners a little bit more, where maybe we see Jonathan Taylor get that big workload and, and have that big breakout game. Because I know a lot of people were, were hoping it was coming. I, I will say that I was never completely out on Marlon Mack. Obviously, he unfortunately got hurt. And so that sort of changed things. But now that it's JT's show... Uh, I think we're all waiting to see him uh, maybe have that big game, and it could really happen this week against Detroit. All right, so since we're talking a lot of running backs, we've talked the Ravens' backfield, we've talked the Colts' backfield. Let's look at the 49ers' backfield because that has become a free-for-all back there with so many guys shuffling in and out because of injury. They've got the Seahawks this week who've been pretty good against the run. If you had to pick a 49ers running back, who would it be? I'm going with Jermichael Hasty right now. I, I thought he was a sleeper last week, and then he really made me sweat as we had to watch <laughs> Jeff Wilson get infinite fantasy points and touchdowns while Hasty wasn't even on the field. But then Wilson went down, unfortunately, with the ankle injury. It, it just seems like ankle injuries are piling up this year. But when he went down, it was Hasty, not Jarek McKinnon, that was really brought in and, and trusted by Kyle Shanahan. And I am a believer that 
Marcus, I know you are a 49ers fan. I, I Nothing against Mostert and Coleman and all these running backs. I think Kyle Shanahan is what makes that, that run game work. Like his system has proven to be beneficial for whoever is the starting running back there. And there's been numerous backs who've started under Shanahan and been fantasy productive. So I'm going with Hasty. I will say, though, the one thing you have to keep an eye out on is Tevin Coleman has been designated for a return, so at any point in the next three weeks, they can activate him. So monitor that situation before, but if he is inactive, go with Jamichael Hasty, in my opinion. I would say Hasty as well, in part because last week we didn't see McKinnon get on the field much. I think he had three touches, and then after the fact, Kyle Shanahan says, oh, yeah, the plan was always to sort of rest him because we gave him so many snaps and so many touches early in the season, and he just has looked kind of heavy-legged the last couple of weeks when he was on the field. Of course, none of us knew that. And for a lot of people who started Jarek McKinnon, uh, there were a lot of angry tweets flooding into my mentions last <laughs> week. Uh, but I do think that Hasty is the guy with a little bit more pop right now. He's running a little bit more effectively, and he's the guy that I would go with as well. I also completely agree that I think it, it really does have a lot to do with Shanahan's scheme versus the individual players. I mean, look, Raheem Mostert is obviously very talented, uh, but let's keep it real. He was a journeyman who had kind of, you know, bounced around to a number of teams before landing in San Francisco and having success. So I think that does play into it. My fear is that Tevin Coleman is activated and comes back to play. That might be, of anything, that might be Kyle Shanahan's blind spot, is that he has this allegiance to Tevin Coleman Despite the fact that of all the running backs the 49ers have put out there, whether it's, you know, Mostert or McKinnon or Hasty or Wilson, Coleman seems to be the least effective of all of them, yet the Niners keep trying to, you know, force that square peg into that round hole. So I, I, that's the guy that, that sort of frightens me, not because I expect huge things from him, but just because they may keep trying to shoehorn him in there uh, and, and having him take opportunities away from the other guys. But... Of all the guys that are healthy and that we know we're going to play, uh, I am with you 100%. I think Jamichael Hasty is the guy that you're going to want in your lineup this week. Uh, so for more analysis like that and even more, be sure to check us out, me and Florio and Adam Rank and Kimmy Checks on NFL Fantasy Game Day. You can find that all the places you stream our fine NFL fantasy content, whether it is uh, in the NFL Fantasy app on NFL.com or at YouTube as well. You can find all of it there. We get going at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific, and take you right up until kickoff. All right, come back, and we'll talk about our best value picks for all you DFS folks out there. Stay tuned for more of the NFL Fantasy Football Show presented by DraftKings. It's time for Best Value presented by DraftKings. As we do every week, we try to get you the most bang for your fantasy buck by finding some values you can place on your DFS roster. So let's start at quarterback. Uh, who do you have this week, Florio? I'm going with Jimmy Garoppolo. I mean, right now the Seahawks are just a team that you can stream your quarterbacks against. They've allowed the most fantasy points to the position. But what I like even more is... It's not like it's been just one or two big blow-up games. Like, I know Kyler Murray went off against them last week, but it's been a consistent thing each week. They've allowed over 21 fantasy points to every quarterback they played this year that's not named Kirk Cousins. So you could just throw on this defense right now, and I expect Jimmy G, who is coming off of his two highest passing yardage game uh, this season, the last two weeks, I think that he can have a big game this week against Seattle. Uh, I like that pick a lot. Uh, I know that uh, on Fantasy Live, Adam Rank had a Jimmy Garoppolo, George Kittle stack this week against the Seahawks. I'm going to go with Drew Locke uh, against the Chargers. And the Chargers have given up some fantasy points to quarterbacks uh, over the, the course of the season. And so this is one where, you know, the, the Broncos have their quarterback back and healthy again. I think Noah Fant hopefully is a little bit healthier as well. We've seen guys like Tim Patrick step up and play well. I think we're still waiting for a huge Jerry Judy game, and that might come as well. Uh, but the Bronco offense as a whole, I think, is getting healthier there with an opportunity to go and play. Uh, in, look, I think it's an interesting quarterback matchup in the sense that you've got two young quarterbacks who like to throw the ball downfield. And, and this could be kind of a fun game sneakily to watch. It's not one of the headliner games this week, but I think it could end up being really entertaining if things turn out the way that uh, I think they can. Uh, over to running back. Who is the running back that you're choosing for your value pick? I'm going with DeAndre Swift, and I know he doesn't have a great matchup on paper against the Colts, but he's just been trending up, in my opinion. Like, the work has been in increasing. He's already their pass catching back, so it's been really encouraging to see him also getting used near the goal line. And 
I don't think it's been talked about a whole lot this week, but Adrian Peterson was limited at practice with an ab- abdominal injury. To me, that is scary. And if it leads to less Adrian Peterson, on Johnson has already been removed from this offense pretty much. So if it's less Adrian Peterson this week due to that injury, it could be even more DeAndre Swift. And at 5,300, I think his price is low because of the matchup, but I think he can still produce and give you fantasy points. I, I think it's interesting that it's taken the Lions so long to get DeAndre Swift into the mix, but we're glad to see it. Uh, you know, so I, I, you know, carry on Johnson, I think has been off fantasy rosters for a while. Adrian Peterson might be heading that way. Uh, I'm going to go, uh, look, this may be low hanging fruit. This may be just a little bit of wish casting, but I'm going to go Le'Veon Bell here. Uh, partially because then obviously he plays in the chiefs offense, but partially because of the revenge factor against the New York Jets. I mean, th- that's one of the defenses we have been picking on consistently all season long. And I do think that the Chiefs are going to give Bell some uh, extra opportunities this week. I, I think Clyde edwards Delaire is a good start as well, so I'm not completely fading him. But uh, I do think there's a little bit of extra here. And I, I do think the Chiefs want to see Lev go out and, and get a little get back against Adam Gase and the team that just let him go not all that long ago. So uh, and especially the fact that uh, the salary is 4600 you can slide him in there, and that gives you a lot of flexibility to do some other things. Okay, over to the wide receivers. Uh, which one do you have your eye on? I'm going with Nelson Swagalar. Yeah. Like I know that that he's became like a he became a meme and and was like a joke in Philly. Like he can't catch the babies, but he's catching the long ball now in Oakland. They've moved him from the slot to out wide. John, kudos to John Gruden. I know people like to get on John Gruden a lot, but he said he saw Aguilar's speed and was like. We got to get this guy out wide and take some deep shots with him. And it's worked. He scored over 14 fantasy points in three straight. But what I really love is last week he had nine targets and he scored over 20 fantasy points. So he is looking like their wide receiver one. Sadly, it is not Henry Ruggs right now. It looks like it is Nelson Aguilar. And I don't think the DFS price is caught up yet. That was kind of surprising to me that 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 uh, the number was so low for him this week. But I do like him, especially because Henry Ruggs has been, you know, he's just not getting a lot of targets. And Aguilar seems to be the guy that's getting those looks from Derek Carr. I'm going to go Scotty Miller uh, because we know that Chris Godwin is not going to be available this week, which I think we we're all sort of surprised by the news that he had a broken finger uh, that is getting worked on. So he's not going to be available for the Buccaneers. And so when we've seen Godwin out, We've seen Scotty Miller step up and get a lot of opportunities. In fact, I saw a stat this morning that uh, per Next Gen stats, four of Tom Brady's five longest completions this season have gone to Scotty Miller, which means he's kind of a boomer bust guy, but with no Godwin, the boom opportunity goes up. He's got a good opportunity to, to make some plays. And look, we have sort of you know taken our shots at the Giants defense. And so that's an opportunity for I think Scotty Miller to slide in there and have some production. I thought tight end had some pretty good options available to us this week for value picks, uh, Florio. Which one did you go with? I thought so as well. I went with Jonu Smith uh, at 4100 I was surprised to see that his price had fallen that far. One bad game, and he's back to being a pretty cheap tight end. I know you could say it's two bad games, but two weeks ago, he left early due to injury, and his backup just went off and put up nearly 20 fantasy points, I believe it was. Ryan Tannehill is still in the top three in percentage and just total throws per game going to tight ends. So the volume I feel like is very safe for John U. Smith. He's not even a tight end that I think you need to play the matchups. I just think he's one of these tight ends that there's very few of them, but if he is healthy and active, I'm starting. I mean, John U. Smith is the tight end seven and that was him with him missing some time with an injury. So I, I, I am surprised that, that the number hasn't caught up to him quite yet either. I, I'm going to go Jared Cook here. And part of it is, look, we know Emmanuel Sanders is not going to be available after he tested positive for COVID. And Michael Thomas may likely be back, may not be back. We're not completely sure of what his health is going to be, even if he is on the field. Uh, the the Saints wide receivers as a group have really sort of underperformed this year. We got a, one nice game out of Sanders. We haven't been able to figure out whether it is, you know, Traquan Smith, uh, Deontay uh, Harris, or uh, Marquez Calloway, who stepped in and had a big week last week. It has sort of been kind of a, a patchwork there. But Jerry Cook has kind of been the one constant. So I, I do see him getting some opportunities, and I like the opportunity to get him in there. Even at 4,400, I'll take the shot out of him. Uh, defense, as we wrap this one up, uh, the we talked about the Patriots offense and their struggles. It seems like that's, that's a good place to, to sort of target, if you could, for defenses. 
Yeah, there's quite a few defenses that I like as streaming options this week. So I just went with the one that was the cheapest. It's the Bills at 3,300. And, and again, it just goes back to – because I am a Bills fan, and I could tell you firsthand, the Bills defense is not what it was last year. They they haven't really been able to shut down opposing offenses unless they're playing the Jets. But this week they get a very weak and struggling Patriots offense right now that is going to be without Julian Edelman, that is with Cam Newton really struggling – and just like we were saying earlier, no one on that team on the offensive side of the ball scares me, so I think you could stream against them. I, I think the Bills are a great pick. I'm going to go with the Eagles. We talked about them a little bit earlier as well with the Cowboys sort of in a similar situation. They've got a potential rookie quarterback starting. They've got an offensive line that is full of holes right now. It is uh, Things are bad down in Dallas, so you know for fantasy, we can sort of take advantage of that and get that Eagles defense fired up uh slightly more expensive at 3500 but certainly not breaking the bank there so i think that's a quality option if you're looking for a defense uh, that you can get in sort of at a, a value price this week in daily fantasy there you go that was best values presented by DraftKings. after the break we'll come back and go through the best of the pack including wondering whether lamar jackson should be concerned or we should be concerned about lamar jackson against the steelers that's next on the nfl fantasy football show Let's hit the best of the pack presented by Panini Trading Cards. We do this every week. We pick three guys out of a pack of cards and we talk about them. It's just that simple. So let's start with about this Lamar Jackson, starting quarterback for your Baltimore Ravens. We talked earlier in the show about the Ravens run game and just kind of the mess that it has been. But Lamar Jackson is sort of underwhelmed this year. He's got a tough matchup on paper against the Steelers. How worried should we be about L. Jax this week? There's lots of reasons to be worried. Like the Steelers defense might be the best in the league. They've allowed the six fewest fantasy points to quarterbacks this year. And they held him last year to less than 12 fantasy points in the one game against him. That was his worst game of the season. But Marcus, it's just one of the conversation like you referenced earlier. It's one of those things like there's plenty of numbers that say that this is a game to be worried about Lamar Jackson. But I still have him as my QB five because maybe it's a flawed logic on my part. But I keep thinking like Lamar Jackson is going to have a big breakout game eventually, right? Like it hasn't happened yet. He hasn't had a signature Lamar game yet. I still think one of those is coming. Like he's going to have a game where he throws for like 250 multiple touchdowns, rushes for like 100 yards. And when everything is pointing, like this is the week that it's clearly not going to happen. I just have a feeling that like when no one is expecting it, Lamar might shine. I do think that if, again, like I said earlier, if the Ravens succeed in this one, it's because Lamar threw the ball effectively. And if there's a spot where you can sort of beat the Steelers, it is downfield. They will give up some long throws occasionally. And I know that's the reason a lot of people sort of have Marquise Brown as a sleeper this week. People are sort of pegging that this is the week that Hollywood has his big blow-up game because maybe he and Lamar connect on a couple of those long throws and get in the end zone. So I'm with you. The numbers suggest that this is going to be not a great game for Lamar Jackson, but I do think that uh, there's an opportunity for him to kind of come out and shine and maybe sort of quiet some of the doubters that are starting to creep up right now and, and have one of those classic Lamar Jackson games uh, that we saw so many times last year. All right, next up. It's Gronk, Rob Gronkowski. And the last couple of weeks, he's come back to life. He's been able to score touchdowns. He and Tom Brady seem to be connecting like they were in New England for all those years. And now as we talked about, Chris Godwin is out. So how much might Gronk benefit from not having Chris Godwin around? I think Gronk can benefit big time because a lot of Godwin's routes come in the slot, so over the middle type routes, and that's where Gronk is going to do a lot of his damage. I especially love how they've been, Brady especially has been targeting him near, you know, in the red zone and near the goal line. So I think I was someone, Marcus, who was high coming into the year on Gronk, and I actually have a team where I drafted him as my starting tight end and have twice dropped him and re-picked him back up. I just can't <laughs> seem to quit Rob Gronkowski. But the last couple of weeks have been fun, and I think right now with Godwin out, you just continue to ride the hot hand and start Gronk. I mean, look, over the last two weeks, back-to-back -back games, he's had 10 catches, 140 yards, two touchdowns. That makes him the tight end one, and admittedly, what is a small sample, but I do, I do think it speaks to how 
he's kind of getting back into shape. He's starting to, uh, you know, kind of get comfortable again. And, you know, they, they are finding him. I know Bruce Arian said they weren't going to try to force the issue when it came to getting the ball to Gronk. But he's getting open. He's making plays. He and Tom Brady, we know, work well together. So uh, it seems to be working out. And where I was sort of skeptical about Gronk and kind of stayed away from him, now I'm sort of, you know, kind of regretting that a little bit, wishing I had taken at least one or two shots on him somewhere in drafts. So uh, you live and you learn. All right, the last one is another tight end. This one, a much younger version. This one is Noah Fant for the Denver Broncos, who really has been the top pass catcher in that Broncos offense. And like Bronk, he wears number 87. Uh, except the Bears are on the docket, and it's not a great – actually, no, it's not uh, – it is – yeah, the Bears. Is it the Bears? I don't know. What it is. But uh, do we start <laughs> Noah Fant this week for the Denver Broncos? Uh, I think you, you can – because of the state of tight end, right? Like like you said, he is their top pass catching option there. And he was really playing well early on in the season. And then coming, like since he's come back, it, the production hasn't quite been what you want. But again, the state of tight end is, is just so bad right now that I think when you get down after the, the top eight or nine tight ends this week, I think he is very much so in that next group and in play. It's the Chargers, by the way. I knew that. I said that earlier, so I don't know why I forgot <laughs> that. But uh, look, I, I think you're starting with Noah Fant just because he is sort of the primary option, I think, in the Broncos passing game. He's the guy who's doing most of the work. And I know he's had uh, a couple of down games, but I, I still have a lot of confidence in him. And you're right. He's one of the guys that I think we can sort of count on week after week in a, at a position where we are struggling to find consistency. So uh, I start Noah Fant. I don't really worry so much about the matchup. I just believe that the Broncos are going to find a way to get him the football, and uh, we'll see if it happens this week against the Chargers. The Chargers is, it, uh, is the opponent. So, All right, that was Best of the Pack, presented by Panini Trading Cards. We'll come back, and we'll talk to our resident nerd about some big running back performances since the turn of the century. That wraps it up on the NFL Fantasy Football Show, presented by DraftKings. Last election, millions of voters were unable to cast their ballots. Why? No game plan. Join the NFL family by making your game plan today and making your voice heard this November. Visit NFL.com slash votes to learn more. Now it's time for our favorite segment of the week. It's Ask a Nerd. We went to our pal Matt Okada and asked him for the best single game running back fantasy performances of the new millennium. Thanks, Marcus. Well, after highlighting some historic wide receiver performances on last week's Ask a Nerd, Tyler Lockett heard the call and actually made the list. We're aiming for a repeat this week with the top five single game running back performances of this millennium. At number five, we have Chiefs and fantasy superstar Priest Holmes. In week 12, 2002, Holmes posted an unbelievable 307 scrimmage yards and three scores en route to 55.7 fantasy points. For reference, that yardage total is more than the Jets have posted as a team in five of seven games this season. We have a tie for third between Sean Alexander and Ladanian Tomlinson at 56.1 fantasy points, and both games also took place in the fabled 2002 season. LT's game came the week after the aforementioned Holmes game, when he totaled a record 48 touches and racked up 271 yards and three TDs against the Broncos. Alexander made our list in week four when he scored five touchdowns and added 231 yards against the Vikings. At number two, we have our first game outside of 2002. It was a whole year later that Broncos back Clinton Portis scored 57.4 points in week 14, 2003 against the Chiefs. Portis did the vast majority of his damage on the ground, rushing for 218 yards and five touchdowns. And coming in at number one, we have our second Chief and fourth member of the AFC West, Jamal Charles. Charles was known for incredible breakaway runs, but this performance was almost all air as he snagged eight catches for 195 yards and four scores, adding another 20 yards and a score on the ground in week 15, 2013. This has been another explosive episode of Ask a Nerd. Have a fun week eight, and may all these fantasy points be with you. 
Thank you, Matt. Always appreciate that. Yeah, so, I mean, it's funny. We talked about wide receivers last week. Then, as he mentioned, Tyler Lockett goes out, has a huge performance uh, for a lot of fantasy folks. So uh, I asked last week, which wide receiver drafted since 2000 would you take if you had the choice? So I might as well just ask the same question for running backs. If there's a running back that's been drafted since 2000 that you would want on your fantasy team, who would it be? I'm going to go with Adrian Peterson here. He's the man who made a who first made a torn ACL look like a knee scrape coming back and just having an absolute stellar season off of that. He's won an MVP, which is something that, I mean, not many running backs can say they've done. And he's still going. Like, I keep waiting for the wheels to fall off of Adrian Peterson, and he just keeps proving us wrong year in and year out. I, I really thought hard about Adrian Peterson, but at the last moment, I decided to switch. And I'm going to go with... Ladanian Tomlinson, and not just because he is one of our colleagues here uh, at NFL Media, but you want to talk about a guy who, in his prime, was an absolute beast. I mean, uh, you know, you're talking about a guy who was just a lock generally for 13, 1400 yards every single season. Not just double digit touchdowns, but we're talking about, you know, 15, 18, 20 touchdowns a season. And on top of it, every once in a while, he would go and throw a pass, too. I mean, uh, trust me, all my friends who are Raider fans lament the fact that it just seemed like Ladanian Tomlinson would throw a touchdown pass at least once a year against them. I mean, the guy was just an absolute beast for the entirety of his career. Uh, and he played at a time when, you know, I mean, you saw that during the, the Ask a Nerd segment. I mean, he got you know, what 40 something touches in a game like that. That is insane to imagine a running back nowadays getting 40 touches in a game. That was consistently Ladanian Tomlinson. Uh, so uh, that's the guy that I would go with. But I really did think very hard uh, about going Adrian Peterson there. So since Tyler Lockett broke into the list last week, uh, if there's one guy that you look at this week that has a chance to maybe break into this top five list, who do you think it would be? First, I, I played Tyler Lockett in a league that I looked like I was easily going to win and then lost big time because of it. So that, that wasn't too much fun. Uh, <laughs> but for running back, I think it would be Dalvin Cook. Those running backs on that list that, that Okada laid out, they were you know bigger name backs who were going to get a lot of touches. And that's what Dalvin Cook is. We know he's an elite talent and he's been practicing. And they're saying that if it, he is not going to be on a snap count or anything like that this week. And the Packers have allowed the most fantasy points to running backs. You can run all over them, but their secondary has played well. I think the Vikings are gonna do everything they can to continue to feed Cook in that run game and keep the game close. I'm gonna go Kareem Hunt. Uh, because you said the Packers give up the most fantasy points to running back. Well, the Raiders give up the second most fantasy points to running backs. And Kareem Hunt has been, he was good even when Nick Chubb was there. But without Nick Chubb, he really is getting so much more work. We know he's going to catch the football as well. He's been effective as a runner. And even for all the good things Baker Mayfield did last week, the Browns still want to run the football primarily. So I'm going to say that if, if a guy is going to go out and have just a bonkers game this week, it is going to be Kareem Hunt. So there you go. Make sure you get Dalvin Cook, Kareem Hunt in your lineups. You probably were anyway, but uh, now is added reason to because uh, maybe they'll end up in an Ask a Nerd segment somewhere down the line. Uh, in the meantime, for us, that is it. We are done. We appreciate you hanging out with the NFL Fantasy Football Show presented by DraftKings. You know the drill. Tell two friends to tell two friends. Rate, review, and remember, of course, truth is stranger than fiction. Fiction has to make sense. Be safe, take care of yourselves, wear a mask, and we will see you on Monday.